this side. So by turning the beehives at an angle this way, the wind's going to come across here and not rock the beehives back. So turning them at a little bit of an angle, even if it's not towards the sun, is going to be better for you. Right off the bat. What we've done here is we've buried a four four inch by four inch post in the ground and we've cut them so they're approximately 20 inches high. 20 inches high gets the beehive off the ground high enough where you're not going to get predators into it, such as skunks, badgers, raccoons. Uh, skunks will scratch on the side of the hive and decimate that hive within 20 minutes. And within 24 hours, they ate every bee in that hive. So you need to get something high enough off the ground to get them. Some people put cinder blocks, some people make stands. We go with a single pillar stuck in the ground. And the reason we do one pillar is because we're going to start doing ant control. Ant control is terrible for beehives. It's not only fire ants, it can be any ant because ants love sugar. So what we've done is we've cut a plastic bucket and sealed them down and we used a rubber seal which we won't use again. We tried it this one time to see it's sealing, but it's starting to seep a little bit of the tar out of the, out of the stuff. Uh, but those buckets are made to hold oil. What happens is ants will crawl up that post, and if they can kind of stick to that plastic bucket and they climb up, they'll go in the oil and die. And you only need a quarter inch of oil, man. Because with one post in that bucket and it's slicked like that, I already eliminated mice and snakes that'll climb up there to get in there. We're worried about the ants. So putting oil like this is awesome. If you have four stands, go get oil pans that you drain the car engine oil out of and just stick the <clears> legs <throat> in those pans and fill them up with oil so that the ants can die in there. Because you don't want ants in here robbing your hive. What we've done next is we put a platform on here. It's the same distance as the hive in the front and the back. So the bees will use the landing pad and we made the sides longer, so that way you can slide the hive back and forth a little bit while you're working it. What kind of oil was it? Motor oil. Don't use vegetable oil. Use motor oil is even better, right, out of your car, that way you're not throwing it away. Oil doesn't evaporate at all, but vegetable oil will attack, attract other bugs. So you want to use an old motor oil. Uh, the other thing about, about only filling them so tall, if you ever get water in it, oil floats. So you always want to keep the oil floating on top. These platforms are bigger than the bucket, so when it rains or anything, and they're six inches from the top, we'll never get any water in there. So we put this bucket six inches off the ground and put a six-inch space between it so the bucket hangs there. And if you want to, re if you remember the old squirrel sheeting around the trees, that's basically what we did is we put that sheeting around that bottom. We lag bolt these platforms down and put braces on them. There's a brace underneath, but these are sturdy. They're not going to go anywhere, and they're made to stay permanently. We set the beehive on this, and usually on the beehive, we'll drill a hole here in the platform and here in the platform, and you can take a ratchet strap, hooking it over the top of the hive, ratcheting it down, so that way if you have cattle, and they bump into it, it'll piss off the bees but knock your, not knock your beehive over. Or if you have high winds like we do in Wyoming, it just doesn't blow it to Nebraska. So those are kind of techniques that you need to make sure that you can keep your hive stable and pulled down. Some people just put eyelets and use bungee cords and just bungee cord them down to hold them down tight. But I want, to, I want you to remember if you've got any type of animal or anything, uh, cows and horses rub, man, and they'll just push this off, and then you're going to have a hell of a mess. So I, I, I suggest that you get a ratchet strap to go down. Now the orientation of these highs, if you notice, they're turned, cocked eyed, not only for the wind, but we want the sun, uh, the first of the day, to hit the front porch. These are union workers. They work from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. on a regular basis depending on where you are. The further north you get, the time span's shorter. The more Mediterranean, the time span's bigger. So they're also a clock. So if you would notice that I have a brick here in the front that has a little line in it. We were lucky to find them here on Jack's property. If you would take something like that and you find 
the day of the year where the sun's at the most high on the longest day, at noon you would put a mark, and when the sun goes down you put a mark, and when the sun comes up you put a mark. And that's how you, pres you position your beehive from the first mark to the noon mark, and you put it right in the center of those marks. Because the sun's going to hit this side of the porch, and by noon, it should be on the end of the porch. Because by the end of the day, you don't want it anywhere on the porch. You want the hive to start cooling down. You want all the little girls to start coming home. So you want to tilt it towards the sun, right between the noon and the morning aspects. So that way it's getting that full spectrum before the massive heat hits it because you want the bees to start coming out and bringing the cold air that's coming off the shaded side a little bit and circulating it through the hive. On the front of these hives, you see the little metal catches. Those are called door feeders. They slide in and out. They have a little opening in the front where the bees can come in. And you take a mason jar you're going to open the mason jar and you're going to put your feed mix. Because remember I told you the first six weeks, you got to feed these bees. And what you do is you take a mason jar, you fill it 50% with a sugar solution or three quarters of the way with a honey solution. And then you fill it up with warm water and shake it to dilute it so it works. You need to promote them with the sugar. And I always say three quarters with honey because that's what they like and a little bit of water promotes them to drink. When you feed bees anytime, and you feed them this way, if you're using corn sugar, they're gonna get dysentery every time. So I always tell you, if you're gonna use corn sugar and do that 50-50 mix, boil some chamomile tea in there and kind of remove that dysentery effect from it. It's gonna give them a little antioxidant and helps them with dysentery, just like it would you. So add a little chamomile. Would you, you add the know chamomile the with the honey? What's or that? Would you use the chamomile also with the honey? No, that's their, that's their food. They're good. They don't get dysentery from that when they eat at home. But these are outer feeders, and this is what I recommend for this area, and I don't ever recommend any type of liquid feeder on top. They make all kinds, and some of them are fantastic. But if you have freezing aspects, those, high, those feeders freeze, and then they break, and then it freezes all your bees in the in the hive, man. Just just like you sprayed water on them, and they'll freeze. So I don't recommend any liquid feeders in the hive or on top. Put them in front. Now you didn't finish. You mix the feed in yeah. the mason jar. Oh, I mix the feed in the mason in jar. And what you do is you take the lid, and you just take a pocket knife, and you poke a whole bunch of holes all over it. And then I want you to get a piece of cloth and put it over that and then screw the lid down on it. And when you flip it over, it drips on that cloth and saturates that cloth with that sugar water and the bees will lick it. And if it starts to drip, it'll drip into those feeders and slide to the front where the bees can walk down and drink and hang off the top. You wanna use a fabric. Use, don't, don't use a, a cheese cloth. Get yourself a good cotton sock or something, something that's gonna absorb a lot where those bees can start sucking it off of that. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> the, other, the other thing when you put the feed in, it's gonna reduce the section of your hive because you've got one section they're not gonna use now. That section that's open that big, you're gonna manipulate during the year. You're gonna, during the fall season, it's only gonna be this big and the summer season is gonna be to that feeder during your honey flow season, it's gonna be all the way open and you're gonna adjust that all the way back down to your winter. And the reason you're gonna do that is because bees have to guard the entrance of their hive. When you have a lot of bees leaving, you can open it up bigger because you can have a lot of guardian bees. When you have a lot of bees on the inside, you need to make that thing shorter because they're up feeding and predators will come in there. Oh goodness. And they'll start robbing that hive automatically. I always recommend never to open it completely wide open, keep it halfway, limit the guards so they can really work the front entrance so you don't have paper wasps and hornets gone. You guys have these little red jacks, man, they'll get in there and they'll wipe out that hive in 24 hours just like a skunk will. They go in there with those mandibles and they start cutting the bees' heads off until they find the queen and when they kill the queen, the bees will leave because they have no, no leadership. They know that hive's disrupted.
So I only open those entrance, those entrance ways small. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the hive apart, and I'm going to show you all the parts, and then we're going to work it like we would work it. So what we'll do is we'll take the whole hive off the stand, and we'll put it together just like you'd use it. On the back of the hive, you see this piece of wood? This piece of wood's made so that the bees will, hive will float forward. The reason we want it to float forward is if you ever get any rain, condensation, or wetness, it'll roll out the front of the door and not stay in the beehive. That also is when you put that front door feeder, tilts it forward so if it leaks, it's not running into the beehive. Right, so we want to put something just to tilt it a little bit forward, something quarter inch to half inch just to cock it forward. Bees like everything level. They are the perfect designer. They're the best engineer people. And if you do top bar beekeeping, you'll watch them grab the top, hook onto the next bee, and they'll make this little chain and they'll swing. And it's like a pendulum. And if you notice, that's why combs round. And that's how they do that is they judge the distance from the walls by snake swinging. And that's how they start building that comb. And they'll build that comb round and then they'll fill in the frames. And that's how bees do it. They're really good engineers. And they like things level and flat. So don't tilt it all the way forward or your combs are going to go like this or they'll start doing cross combing. These Langstroth hives, you don't have a lot of problem with that because they have foundations and plastic frames. So you get your board set, and the next thing you're going to set down is you're going to set down your bottom board. Now these bottom boards are dual purpose bottom boards, but they're, uh, I'm going to recommend Jack to try to get bottom screen boards because of the, the, the it's hot here in the summer. This board has a deep ridge, and if you flip it over, it has a small ridge. This is a winter ridge, making the entrance smaller for the bees. This is a summer ridge, so more bees can come in and out as fast as they can. We set that in the center, facing the sun, and we, we're going to put the, the deep part in because we're already past the springtime and we're going to be working. The next part is your brood box. Now, if you notice, some of these brood boxes have holes in the front. Some don't. It doesn't matter if they have the holes in the front or not. But the put hole, it to the front. But keep the hole to the front of the hive. The hole in the front is so that way, if you notice more bees coming in here, you know the queen's up in the upper box. If the bees are coming down here, she's in the lower box. When you start seeing see them coming here, that's when it's the time to usually rotate your box around. But we'll get that part when we're gonna when I work the hive. How big of a hole if you don't have one and you want to drill it? Thumb. What? A, three eighths. B size. Three three eighths, no bigger than half inch. Anything half inch, they're gonna put burr comb over it. Anything smaller than that, that three eighths, they're gonna put propolis over it and seal it up. So you want it about three eighths of an inch to about half inch around. And what's really cool about if you get them that big, you can get a cork and you can just stick a cork in it if you want to, if you want to close them off. But that's just made for an extra airflow and they kind of watch to see where your queen's in the hive. You don't need them. Inside this hive box, this is a 10 frame box. The frames inside the box, these are called Pergo. When the bees come, we're going to spray these down with sugar so they'll want to work them. Bees do not like anything new. Bees like things old. They like to work things old. So this, they're going to have to promote it with sugar water to make them start cleaning it. And they're going to start cleaning and they'll see, start seeing the cells and they'll start bringing out the cells on the frame. They make all different kinds of frames. Top bar is just the top bar. It's usually made into a triangle with a sharp point, and you run wax down it, and the bees will build down their comb. You'll have a wood frame, and then you'll put plastic foundation in it. It usually has wire running across it to hold it steady, and they'll build in the frame. You've got plastic inserts that fit in the wood frames that look like these, and they're plastic inserts. 
do the same thing. And then you have full plastic frames. The newer plastic frames that I'm that I'm going to start getting because they're new are black. The black ones are able to see the little white larva in if you're going to start doing lots of queening and grafting. Grafting is where you pull the queens, uh, the larva out to start making queens. And if you have the black boards, you can see the larva a lot better. What size are these? These are 5.2 millimeter frames, and the bees that will work these are 5.2 to 5.7 millimeters. These are large frames. These are not a small frame bee. Also on these frames, if you notice, they're set where they have a wedge design. The most important thing in beekeeping is not the frame, it's not the bee, it's the bee space. In bee space, that's all the space they need to work through, is that little extra right here. If you notice this side, it's way wider. You want the bees to make the comb to the edge of the bottom run all the way up. And the bees will work through here. If you put your bees in the box and they're spaced like this, you're gonna have all kinds of funky comb inside there. They'll cross cut it. They'll just maybe lay a stack of comb four inches long and this one not at all. So you need to put the frames in the hive and push them all to one side so you can see them all spaced together. I can get mine untucked here. And then you usually have your little hive tool and you stick it in and you slide them to center them. And that way the only big bee space is on the ends of the hives and everything in the center is the three eighths. When you do top bar beekeeping, all the bars go together. There's no open space because the bees aren't coming up to the next level. And that's the difference between top bar and Langstriff is the bees move up the box and in top bar they move halfway in the box. And top bar beekeeping you have to move frame out slide frames forward every time you check them because when they fill this one up they're only going to go so far and then they're done because it's too far away from the queen so you got to start sliding those frames and moving them out we're going to show you when I work this how you're going to slide the frames in this <coughs> yes so you're saying that for wax production you want the top bar and for honey production you want the langstrom yes works better but I mean, do you, you, you still get both from each? Yes. Wax and, and honey? Right. Yes. you got to remember in top bar, the reason you get more wax production is because I'm cutting all the wax out of the hive every time. Okay. Right? In a top or in a Langster system, I just cut the caps off and spin them, and they already have all the wax in them. I don't really remove much wax. The wax removal that I'm getting is usually only from the capping. Yes. But at top bar, do you harvest the wax you take the honey? Could you not feed the wax back to the honey? Can they reuse that? They don't reuse the wax. Unless you're going to print it out into a foundation. It wasn't so in the past. I've had a, a, my hive. They came and took everything out of it. I mean, the, the top bar I have threw it in there and they just kind of cleaned it up. Did not they leave the wax on the ground? or? It was like in a bucket. It was left over. What do you think, Shane? Well, Do they take, reuse you the can, wax? You can take the wax and mold it down and like paint it onto those kind of frames, the plastic frames, and that'll help them draw it out faster and quicker and more efficiently. Yeah, you can reuse. Yeah. The bees won't you reuse their wax. You can reuse their wax. Like he said, on these type of frames, these, the reason I like these is when you're done with them, you scrape everything off and you throw them in the dishwasher. You pull them out of the dishwasher and any wax you have left over, you heat it up, just take a paintbrush and put it on. And when it dries, you spray it with sugar water and you stick it back in and then you start all over again. That's why I like them, because I can control my wax. Wax foundation, I think, is bad. And the reason I say it's bad is because all over the world, people send wax to a couple different companies to print out the wax foundation. If you're on the East Coast, you might have different plants, pesticides, smog 
that those bees walk with their feet all over that wax. And then when they ship it to the company and they boil it down and they print them out on those wax foundation sheets, that stuff's in there. And then it's sent to my house. And it's like that Chinese food thing that you got. You're dumping old food in that crap box, man. Every time. It's like, ooh, that was good. I'll just set that box there. And the next time I eat, we'll just stick it back in that crap box. And that's how I feel about that. That's terrible. The next thing of the hive is called a top cover. The inner cover that sits inside there has two uses. This is an airflow device and a feeding device. You can also take a one gallon bucket, put a cloth, another cloth and a rubber band over it, put honey in it, flip it over on top of this, and feed the feet on it. But you gotta remember, if anything happens, it'll flood that high. These are made for feeders as well. These are airflow devices in the front to control the airflow in and down through the hive for circulation. When you'll see your bees, you'll have a group that are facing you fanning, and you'll see some with their butts to you fanning. The ones with the butts are fanning air in, the ones with the faces to you are fanning air out, and they're circulating up through the hive. There'll be bees up here fanning them down, and they circulate the air through the hive. On these hives also, they're made to go forward and backwards. In the winter time, you're going to pull the top back to you, and that closes off that airflow. And in the summertime, you push it forward and it lets the airflow flow. This is the top cover. This top cover can be metal, plywood, anything you want. It's just made to cover the top of the hive because now you've put them in a cage. You don't want rain going in there and all kinds of stuff. Now that's the only reason this is on there. Now as Jack advances, we're going to put another brood box on here that will have the bees in it. He'll get a queen excluder and he'll get honey boxes. They're all going to basically have the same frames. The queen excluder's smaller so the bees can come up but the queen can't. And you don't want larvae in your honey. Now, when we come and we get the boxes of bees, the guy Jason that's coming is bringing the bees already in a super. He took his bees and he made do little splits. And he made nukes. And since that's a good way to do it, those nukes took off and they're actually a month ahead of time. They were so big that he's gonna have to put them in a hive. <laughs> Nukes are way better than packaged bees. That's why. They're already laying and they're already propagated, so he's already got them in a super box, and he's going to put a screen on top and a screen on bottom, and he's just going to bring a whole super box. So we're, box on top. So we're just going to, well, we're going to set it on the bottom, because bees work up. We want them to work into the next box. So I'm going to work the bees real quick. First thing you're going to do is you're going to orientate yourself where you're at at this place and what you're going to do. If you're going to put super boxes on it, if you're going to do an inspection, or if you're going to do honey, you need to go ahead and remember what you're going to do to bring out your equipment, bring it out before you do anything. Just don't fall. <coughs> I'm going to go back now. Walk through what you're going to do. We're going to